Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to this first uh, live presentation after our long lockdown. What a relief. And uh, it's a very special presentation uh, this evening. Great pleasure to welcome Mariana, uh, who's going to be talking about from Scotland with love. Mariana is a postgraduate student in science communication at this university. Uh, so a very welcome addition to our historical community. And I won't uh, say anything about how Mariana got involved with this uh, project. I'll leave that to her. But Mariana, looking very much forward to your presentation. Good. Um, good evening. Do you hear me? All good? Okay. <clears throat> tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Good evening and welcome. Bonsoir a tous et, ben, a tous et bienvenue. Dobro večer i dobro došli. Tonight I would like to take you on a journey to meet the Monroe family and their collection. But before I take you on a journey, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Miriana Moffat, and as Terence said, I'm a student, postgraduate student in science communication, something that I hold very dear to my heart. Being a student in science communication has got its rewards, but also its challenges. One thing that I really love about it, that it pushes you to go always beyond your boundaries, always striving to do something more. And tonight I've got a little surprise for you, but we will get to that a little bit later. Apart from science communication course, I'm also doing a postgraduate course in biological anthropology. I'm also doing a course in information studies with, with, with Victoria University of Wellington and a French course. And you might think what an unusual mix of papers, but believe me, they all complement each other very well. And I will reflect upon that throughout the lecture tonight. What is it that I love about history of medicine, what I love about science communication, biological anthropology, well, all together. I come from Europe, from beautiful Croatia, and one thing that I miss about Europe is a long history, beautiful architecture, and European romance. Please do not get me wrong. Uh, whenever I think about New Zealand, I think of stunning nature, I think of tranquility, kind people who are very good at the DIY. But my journey into science communication and throughout my courses uh, are always accompanied with a, one question, why? Believe me, that question has been my faithful companion throughout my studies. So why Monroe's? Why the collection? Why indeed? So it has all started with a paper in science communication, uh, the internship. I have always been a great admirer and visitor of museums and libraries, galleries. And I was truly hoping that my internship would be somewhere around there. There are two periods in history that I'm particularly fond of, and one is late Middle Ages, and the other one is Renaissance. Quite frankly, 18th or 19th century science has never been my thing, until I was um, Richard German, who is Divisional uh, Manager Health Sciences and Sciences Library, came up with the idea to do the internship on the Monroe Collection. Until that point, I knew very little about the Monroes, I must admit. I knew only about the Foramen Monroe as a previous student in anatomy and about the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, but nothing else. And I wasn't very sure how that would evolve. What seemed at the beginning, at the very narrow uh, mountain goat 
path soon turned to be high-speed motorway. And th that, this is how the story uh, began. Now, I had some, um, we, we dis defined some uh, aims. So why should we do the uh, internship on the Monroes? So one of the items, uh, one of the aims was to bring the collection closer to the public. And me as the intern, my task was to help the host organization in planning and organization of the exhibition, organizing public talks, possible blogs, and whatever comes up more. Our goal was also to raise awareness of history of medicine and the treasures held by the Otago University Libraries. And believe me, there are many. And also get well acquainted with the collection explore works of Alexander Mondra Secundus for an ebook. So as a student in science communication in my last year, uh, we were challenged, it was actually a requirement, to do an ebook. That was the final assignment. So when I said that studying science communication has got really its challenges. Um, it also encourages you to overcome your fears because I have never ever thought, although I wanted, um, I never thought that I would be able to write an ebook, let alone that somebody will read it. But it happened and it's been quite rewarding. So my start on the internship uh, was not very smooth because last August um, we went into lockdown, thanks to the COVID, for three weeks. So I was unable to physically access the special collections, but I used those three weeks to explore and read a lot about the Monroes outside the collection. So here we've got uh, just few uh, titles, few books that I use, Dr. Monroe's, and this is my copy, which I acquired uh, through the antique shop in the United States. And even though it was COVID, it arrived. The other one, uh, so this, uh, the author is Rex Wright Sinclair, who is also the author of a biography or of Sir David Monroe, called Thoroughly a Man of the World. But probably one of the most interesting books that really got me was The Monroes of Ochenbaui, and I hope I pronounced it correctly, by um, John Alexander Inglis, who was connected, who is one of the descendants of the Monroes. And that book here was published in uh, 1911. The one, the little one at the bottom is my ebook, uh, and I wrote a book about the Secundus. So what has prompted me to write a book about the Secundus in particular? Well, I like always, as a science communication student, I like to do something different. And my idea was to bring together past with the present. Secundus, he was known as one of the best anatomists of his time. He was also a professor of the university and the father. And my idea was to organize a virtual interview with him in which he could probably give some advice and information, useful information to the current students nowadays. Something that would be applicable back then, but also today. Now, just to give you a little bit of information about the scope of the Monroe Collection, uh, there are approximately just over 350 items in, in the collection, and I have grouped them by centuries. So here we've got the 16th century, 12 printed items. Uh, and this, is, this here is the uh, a photo taken from one of my favorite books, oops, sorry, one of my favorite items, which is um, by Andreas Vesalius, the Corporis Humani Fabrica. I'm absolutely in love with that book. Uh, it was, uh, this is the second edition. Uh, it was printed in 1555 in Basel, Switzerland. 
The other one, absolutely, also absolutely stunning, is Galen's Opera Omnia, or his complete works, published in 1556. Now, why did I choose this, these two particular items to be representatives of the uh, 16th century uh, works? The first one, Vesalius, his, his illustrations of the, his drawings of the human body are so, so impeccable, absolutely stunning. But the Galen one, I find him very interesting because on the side here, you can probably see there are some scribbles. And these little scribbles were done, were done by Secundus them, themselves, by Secundus himself, which means that he was quite a good student. He was studying hard. Uh, here or in this corner, we see his scribbles in Greek. The ones at the bottom were in Latin. And what does that tell us? That they were very, very skilled in absolutely good command of classical languages, both Latin and Greek, but also due to their studying abroad, uh, abroad they were very fluent in German, French, and, many, some, and maybe some other languages. Uh, both Vesalius and Galen were lit, written in Latin. But what is interesting about this uh, 17th century item, Hippocrates, uh, published in 1657 in Geneva, was that it has got on each page, it has got two columns. One column is written in Latin and the other one is written in Greek, the same text in two classical languages. Isn't it marvelous? Now, there are 17 items within the group of 18th century. They are all printed. And when we get to the 18th century, there are 174 items, out of which 38 are manuscripts and 136 printed. The manuscripts are all from the Monroes. I picked here Hermann Boerhaves, a 1750. 51 edition, and it's about uh, methods of studying medicine. As an example, here I have chosen um, 19th century Georges Cuvier, uh, his um, lessons on uh, comparative anatomy, uh, published in 1805. And can you imagine that beauty? It's written in French, and that's where my studying of French comes very useful. Now, there are 147 items here, out of which eight manuscripts, mainly tertiuses, we will get to that later, and there are about 139 items printed. So who were the Monroes? Instead of me giving you the introduction to Monroes, I've got a little surprise for you. And as a student in science communication, I have actually done something that I have never done before. I've made a little documentary. So I will let you enjoy a 10 minute documentary. So would you mind just making yourselves com comfortable? And with the sounds of the ocean waves, let's go and meet the Monroes. As Alexander Monroe Tertius took his last breath on a cold Scottish winter night in 1859, a letter was on its way to his son David in New Zealand. He was to inherit a library and a large number of specimens collected over 150 years by three generations of professors and chairs in anatomy at the University of Edinburgh. In 1871, over 350 books and manuscripts left the shores of Scotland. It would take 58 years until the collection reached Medical School or Library at the University of Otago. The collection tells the story of their lives, medical achievements and the times in which they lived. So who were the Monroes? They were all called Alexander Munro, known as Primus, Secundus and Tertius. The medical dynasty didn't start with Primus, but with his father John, the prominent 17th century surgeon and one of the founders of the University of Edinburgh Medical School. John was a man of great vision and ambition, 
and his involvement in founding the medical school created a pathway for Premus's medical training. Premus, born in 1697, studied medicine in Edinburgh and abroad. A diligent student, he was also an accomplished anatomical artist. He returned to Edinburgh in 1719 to teach anatomy. His manuscript, Life of Dr Alexander Munro in his own handwriting, provides an account of family life, including his appointment as Professor of Anatomy in 1720. His skill in dissecting the human body and teaching style made his classes extremely popular with medical students. In 1725, he married Isabella MacDonald, and they had eight children, but only four survived into adulthood. In 1726, he published his book, Anatomy of the Human Bones, which had eight editions in his lifetime. Just like his father, Primus created a path for his son Alexander Monroe Secundus. Born in 1733, Secundus was also a skilled and influential anatomist, eventually surpassing his father in fame and popularity. He was an avid researcher who described the interventricular communication in the brain, known as Foramen of Monroe and monroe Kelly Doctrine on intracranial balance. He combined his research with his work as a practicing physician. He was also a high-profile member of Edinburgh Society during the vibrant 18th century period of intellectual and scientific growth known as Scottish Enlightenment. Secundus dedicated his PhD thesis to his father and wrote, Since there is no one to whom I owe more, or I would please him whom I have dearer, or prefer to emulate who needs less flattery, he deserves more respect. I pray that you receive this dissertation dedicated to you, father, excellent teacher, son, student, professional rival, as a monument of gratitude to your soul. We know quite a lot about Secundus from the memoirs written by his son Tertius. But what does he say exactly? His father, that means Primus, had designed him for the medical profession and also indulged the hope of deriving assistance from him in teaching anatomy. Dr. Monroe Secundus was peculiarly fitted for this latter duty. He possessed an insatiable thirst for medical knowledge, an uncommon share of perseverance and a very good memory for the cultivation of which he had been very much indebted to the excellent discipline of his mother. Seldom forgetting any circumstance of moment which he had observed in nature, heard in conversation, or gleaned from books. Alexander Monroe Tertius, born in 1773, graduated in medicine in 1797 and moved abroad to continue his career. In his absence, he was appointed professor and chair in anatomy by his father Secundus and returned to Edinburgh to teach. Nepotism was a common practice at the time and high profile positions were considered inheritable. However, Tertius was lacking the drive and ambition of his namesakes, and his reputation fell well short of the illustrious ones of his predecessors. He resigned in 1846, aged 73, thus ending a 126-year tradition of holding a position of professor and chair in anatomy. To hear more about the Monroes and Tertius, health and sciences librarian Richard German, a long-time admirer of Scottish intellectuals, shares his thoughts. I don't know, I think Tertius has had a bad press. Oh, very much so. Um, yeah, he's had some very significant detractors, like Charles Darwin. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> so yeah, he wrote to his sister, Charles Darwin wrote to his sister about how um, unpresentable his yes. physical appearance was, how messy he was, how, how even dirty he came to the lectures, and how very disorganized and uninterested he's been in teaching. And yet he was professor of anatomy at Edinburgh for a very long time. Yes. Yeah, he yes. had. Um, I'm also interested in the progenitor of them all, like John. John Monroe. Monroe. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if I had to pick one at the moment, it would be Secundus. Secundus. Secundus yeah. is absolutely brilliant. And um, he was a brilliant man, but not just a brilliant physician. Yes. Yeah, he yes. was. Um, he was a good member of the society. He, he contributed a lot to his community. He had such a variety of interests. Yes, he did. And so that's something that has been really, really what Kind of a impacted renaissance memory. Tertius' son, Sir David Monroe, inherited the collection and organised its journey to New Zealand. None of Sir David's sons were interested in medicine, so he bequeathed the collection to his son-in-law, James Hector, a practising physician. Upon James's death in 1907, his wife, Lady Hector, donated the collection to the General Assembly Library in Wellington. The Monroe Collection is currently on loan to Special Collections at the University of Otago Central Library, and it has great responsibility in preserving such a valuable collection. 
Alexander Ritchie is a Special Collections subject librarian whose experience and skills show that multiple factors need to be considered when handling and storing old manuscripts. We have a responsibility to future generations to ensure that they're available uh, for the generations that are yet to be born to be able to access these, as well as to enable folks now, such as yourself, to come in and research with the collection um, and experience it. Uh, so many of the works, Munro works, and many of the other works in special collections require special conditions um, to do that, to protect them and ensure that future access. So low light, uh, steady temperature, stable humidity. And so to help with that, we have climate controlled stacks. We keep them closed, only staff access the stacks. Uh, and we also work with our library bindery to uh, provide special packaging to uh, contain and protect fragile items. Uh, and in terms of access, we, we provide access in person and from a distance. Uh, but when people are accessing items in person, we require careful handling. Um, the items have to stay on site, so they can't be taken away from the library. Um, but we also hold exhibitions and um, put those exhibitions online and, and provide digital images of items wherever possible. Why is this collection important and why should we care? Collection as such is, is really, I consider it to be the founding collection of the medical library. Even though there'd been, as I said, there'd been a library here since 1912, the collection arrived in 1929, but prior to 1929, there was nothing really of any significance in the collection. The, having the Monroe collection here put this library on the map, so to speak, um, internationally, because we had a collection of 16th to 19th century material that actually nobody else held. Um, well, the manuscripts from the Monroes themselves, those are unique. It's also important, I think, because it, Dunedin, it's named after Edinburgh in Scotland, Dunedin, which is the Gaelic name for Edinburgh. Um, it cemented our relationship being a Scottish-influenced university in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, so we, it, it, Edinburgh University is where the Monroes taught, you know, um, so it, it's nice to have that connection to Edinburgh. Um, but the collection itself, I think, is absolutely fundamentally important. Nearly 100 years have passed since the Monroe collection arrived in the Dunedin. I hope that some other equally remarkable collection is on its way to these shores. No matter how long it takes, I hope it will be worth the wait, just as it was with the Monroe collection. Thank you so much. I hope you have enjoyed it. As I said, it is my very first documentary now, so please don't judge me hard, harsh. I would like to continue now with um, the Monroe pedigree. So I just would like to let you know who I'm going to talk now more in detail and what items from the collection in relation to these people I'm going to show you. Now, we will start here. I've, I've um, sorry. I've here highlighted, and don't worry, I didn't highlight on the old book. Um, uh, here is Sir Alexander Monroe. Then we will follow, Sir Alexander Monroe is, was not a medical uh, professional, but he is an absolutely remarkable personality. Uh, here we've got John. So the medical dynasty starts with him. He was a surgeon. Then we've got Alexander Monroe Primus. Here we've got Secundus. Tertius and Sir David Monroe, Tertius' son. So I will just take you through uh, some of them. Now, if you have noticed how I ended my credits, and um, sorry, I just would like to use this opportunity to say a very big thank you to everybody who has made this documentary possible. Without your help, I wouldn't be able to make it. Now, 
if you remember, uh, if, if you uh, notice that the last line in the um, in the credit, it says no husbands were harmed in the making of this uh, documentary. And this is something that I picked from the social media. Now, we live in the era of social media when uh, people with more likes, followers are influencers. So today we've got influencers. But when I look back in the past, I like to think, so who were the people that were influences to the Monroe physicians? So the person that stands out to me is Sir Alexander Monroe of Bearcroft. Now, what is so beautiful about this person? Through my research, I actually like to call him Pater Familias because I think he actually set the tone how a family should behave. He is epitome, in my opinion, of the resilience and determination. And I'll explain why. So Sir Alexander Monroe, so he is a 17th century man. He, together with his young brother, uh, together with his brother David, he was in King Charles II's military service. And in those days, there was a battle between Oliver Cromwell on one side and those who supported King Charles II, and uh, Alexander and his brother were on the king's side. They both uh, participated in, the, they, they both fought in the battle at Worcester in 1651, and unfortunately, his brother David got killed. Now, he returned, he, he, sp uh, he spent only a few years in the, in the military service uh, when he um, started studying law and he became a lawyer. But uh, a group of Scotsmen went to London uh, on one occasion and he accompanied them. What he didn't know was that the, those Scottish men went there to participate in the, what was called Rye House Plot. And the aim behind that Rye House plot was to assassinate King Charles II. Due to some various reasons, I think um, um, there was a fire, so the king returned earlier to London when well, then participated, and the plot fell through. So those Scotsmen were arrested and imprisoned. And along with them, unfortunately, our Alexander. Now, they spent some time in London prison, but then the whole group was brought back to Scotland for a trial. Some of them were uh, imprisoned for a long time. Some of them were executed. But what happened with Alexander? Well, luckily, he received a king's pardon. And there is a, I believe there is a reason for that. I think that King Charles II knew his brother David, and he knew that his brother David died fighting for the king. So I think that it was one of those ways that um, King Charles pardoned him, knowing that even Alexander was on his side. And this is something that Alexander spoke uh, about it throughout his life. There were two things that I think marked Alexander's life. One was his feeling of guilt because he survived his brother who was killed very young. The other thing was once he was pardoned, he still served a year, uh, year sentence in prison, but once he was pardoned, what would he do? Well, he had to pass sit, sit again the exam for uh, uh, practicing law, but then he decided to go into politics. And in 1791, he became a member of the um, Scottish Parliament. And in, uh, sorry, in 1691 and in 1695, he was knighted. So when we look that he became a knight and only 12, 12 years earlier, he was on the brink of execution. I hope you will agree that this is the remarkable uh, strength of determination and resilience. Alexander had, now Sir Alexander, he had a wife and seven children. While he was imprisoned, his second son, John, 
had to look after the family. So he, uh, he was only a 13 year old boy at that time. So at a very early age, he developed a sense of responsibility. We do not know what has made John decide to go into medicine, but I believe that the death of his sister and also the uncertainty of the family, what's going to happen while his father was imprisoned, made him decide to go into something where he could help people, but also bring some sort of a steady income and a good career, good, good prosperous career. So he was apprenticed to two practicing surgeons and having finished his apprenticeship, he continued his studies abroad in Leiden and the Padova. And University of Leiden will be very important for his future plans. Now, he, um, upon return, he went uh, into military services, spent a few years, got married, and came back to uh, Edinburgh and set up a surgeon apothecary. Now, there were two uh, events in his life that were particularly, I would say, important. In 1704, his father died, Sir Alexander, who was, I think, the pillar of the family. And we do not know exactly what year his wife died, but there is a, a time period between um, 1705 to 1711. Uh, so he basically faced loss of two people in a fairly short period of time. He, with the death of his wife, his son Primus was only a very little boy. So if we assume that she died in 1705, Primus would have been only eight. Uh, Mon, uh, John didn't marry for the second time for another 10 years until uh, Primus was appointed professor. Um, so he was basically looking after uh, Primus as a sole parent. And what he did, he took him everywhere. Uh, whenever he was attending the poor or the sick or whomever, Primus was always with him. So he was learning the, the craft from a very young age. John was very active in the incorporation of surgeons. He was treasurer and he was twice deacon of the surgeons. And I believe that by being a treasurer, he knew how much money is there to, um, to wriggle around. Uh, he was so popular and active that he got a seat in the town council. And by having a seat in the town council, he's, he got acquaintances and he got power and networking. So his, he had the vision to set the path for Primus to establish a school of medicine based on a, a, a Leiden University model and basically to decide for Primus's future. Now, his influence uh, enabled founding of the School of Medicine, and this is where we get to little Alexander. We have already heard quite a bit about the Alexander, about how good he was at drawing, that he was a very diligent student. And he married Isabella MacDonald in 1725. They had eight children, out of which only four survived. And Donald and Secundus became physicians. His oldest son, he was an advocate, a lawyer. So what does English, if you remember the book that was my first inspiration and insight into the Mondras, English writes about the primus, a man of extraordinary energy with a wide range of interest outside the immediate work of his profession, and he took a prominent place in Edinburgh society. He was also for seven years a librarian to the Corporation of Surgeons. Now, there are two items from the collection that I would like to show you tonight. The first one is his, sorry, the first one is the Anatomy of Human Bones and Nerves, which he published. The first uh, edition was in 1726, when Primus was not even 30 years old. Quite remarkable for a young man. Now, the catalogues in the Mondra collections are under cataloged either M and the number or A and the number. M means that that was the original collection. And if there is an A, 
and the number of, in the catalog. That means that um, the item was acquired additionally, either through the donation, donation of the family or maybe even purchased at the auction. So uh, this particular item is, um, this is the uh, sixth edition and it's written, there is one item, but there are three volumes in it. What I absolutely love about those old fashioned printed books is look at their titles. They are very crowded. They are, there, there is a lot of information, something like my, my PowerPoint slides. Um, and it gives us insight actually how at the first sight they want to provide you with a lot of information. The other one here, uh, this is his address to the students. So he addresses his students and he tells them what they can expect throughout studying anatomy. Another interesting thing is, particularly in this edition, um, we've got a lot of handwritten scribbles. In this case, uh, this is the introduction when he's addressing the students. It says on the page six, it says, oh, you ought here to mention Sue's tables. Sue was another anatomist. A very, very interesting, um, interesting publication. The next one that I find very fascinating is the history of anatomy under the catalog number M N166. So, he wrote about all the anatomists, all the scientists that were important in the world. And I don't know how they managed to acquire so much information. And I was quite curious. Um, there is an index, even though it's a manuscript, there is also an index in the end. And I put together all the names. He listed 259 names and scientists, mainly physicians and mainly anatomists. Really remarkable, isn't it? Now, it is a, a manuscript, so it hasn't been printed. What I find really interesting is uh, it starts with a prolegomena, which means a preface. So when you write something, do you really start with a preface? That's very unusual, but very interesting. The last entry, so the last entry in the manuscript is uh, for Christian Gottlieb Ludwig. It was in 1748. We don't know when, he, when did he start writing it, but it tells us that he carried on writing until 1748. Now, uh, we've heard in the documentary that Primus was a very um, even tempered, that he was very kind, but actually he was a, quite a harsh critical thinker. And here on page 76, we've got the entry about Andreas Libavius, a Saxon, though not properly to be ranked among the anatomists, ought not to be passed over here because he in 1615 describes from some unknown Paracelsian, the method of transfusion of the liquors of one animal unto the vessel of another is a cure of disease for the contrivance of which some later authors proposed to themselves immortal honor. I thought that was quite neat. Now we get to Secundus. So we heard quite a lot about Secundus. Um, he was really, really into it, but he also lived during the time of, uh, time of Scottish Enlightenment. So uh, Tertius wrote a lot about what he was like, both as a parent and, and scientist in his uh, memoirs. So these are just few, um, a few facts about him. So he started teaching, co-teaching co anatomy with his father Primus um, in the period 54 to 58, 1754 to 1758. So what happened there? The classes, Primus was so popular, the classes grew up in number so much that he had to split classes and Secundus was teaching the classes in the, in the evening. So, but from the year 1759, uh, Secundus was the only one teaching anatomy, and he taught anatomy for almost 50 years. Um, I also got, for those who love statistics, I also got um, that he taught uh, over 14,000 students. So he said some years were a little bit leaner, where he would have about 200 students, and some years were good when he would have 400 students per year. Not a bad number. 
Now, he married his cousin, Catherine Inglis, and they had five children. There are three items that I would like to show you in the collection. One are anatomical lectures delivered by Secundus in winter 73-74. So he was born in 1733. So uh, when he delivered that, he was already a 40-year-old man. We can assume that he was very experienced by then. So what I really love about this lecture is the beginning at the academic year. So this is how he addressed his audience his students. Gentlemen, I love it. When we consider the office of a physician or surgeon, one of which I'm to suppose all present mean to be, which is to preserve health or to cure a disease, i.e. to prevent or redress disorders in the human body, it will appear to you evidently to follow that the foundation of their science must consist in the just knowledge of the situation, structure, connection, and properties of the several organs of the several powers by which its functions are performed in health. This knowledge being acquired by taking asunder the, uh, the parts of our body or by dissecting it, the art is termed anatomy. When I wrote that, when I read that for the first time, I pictured myself wearing a very long gown with a starched collar. I don't know, that was just the impression. The second item is the history of anatomy. I showed you the history of anatomy that Primus wrote, and this is the um, Secundus's take with his own twist on the anatomy. Actually, uh, they are slightly different. There are, uh, of course, the names match, but the way he addressed it was completely different from Primus's. So he wrote them in two volumes. The first one is until the scientists until the 18th century, and the other one is from 18th century onward. Now, what is interesting is while Primus lists his scientists chronologically by centuries, Secundus does that by countries. He still has all the prominent scientists, let's say in the 17th century, but he would categorize them by their countries, French, Italians, the Dutch, the British, etc. Now, the third item that I would like to show you is the three treaties on the brain, the eye and the ear, illustrated by tables by Alexander Monroe in the year 1797. Now, in chapter one, he gives the full description of the foramen Monroe, but not only that. Here, so this is how he, this is the, the, um, uh, the title page, this is the uh, chapter one, and here we've got the declaration signed by four professors in which, um, in which they say, we whose names are subscribed hereby declare that on the 13th day of June, 1794, Dr. Monroe demonstrated to us in the anatomical theater, the human brain cut perpendicularly at the right side of its septum lucidum, and along with it, a drawing of it marked in the table first, just finished by Mr. Fife, that we examined and compared these accurately together and found them to correspond in all respects. Particularly, we saw distinctly a hole or passage by which the lateral ventricles communicate with each other and with the third ventricle. Now, here it says that Monroe discovered the foramen in 1753, and finally, <laughs> they signed that declaration in 94. So it took 41 years? Oh, well, he was very patient. We get here to the tertius. Now, as Richard said in the documentary, tertius had a little bit of a bit press, and I do feel sorry for tertius and I would like to give him justice. So yes, he was Messi professor, even when the way you look at him in the photo is not all stiff. Um, he was not a very brilliant lecturer, but more importantly, he was more inclined toward physiology, not anatomy. He was much better practitioner than maybe even his predecessors. But what marked and what tarnished, in a way, his career were the anatomy murders that occurred in uh, 1829. Uh, if you don't know, uh, 16, um, in, um, 
1829, but not only in 1829. The problem of supplying bodies for dissection has been a century long, even since Primus's time. But in those, in those days, they just limited themselves on body snatches and grave diggers. In 1829, uh, William Burke and William Hare, they committed 16 uh, murders on fairly healthy bodies, including one child, and they were caught. So why did these murders occur? Uh, Primus was not into dissecting and he really performed it. In order for students to learn well anatomy, uh, there was a large number, increased number of students um, wanting to learn more, and there was a number of extramural classes. One of those classes were led by Dr. Robert Knox, who was himself, he was a very brilliant anatomist, but he wanted to provide a little bit more. That's how he started buying the corpses from William Burke. It was a very hefty price. Uh, Burke and Hay were caught. Uh, here, uh, Burke was uh, tried and he was hanged. Uh, here was uh, turned King's ransom. Now, as a kind of, uh, to please the crowd, because the crowd was of course outraged, uh, Tertius performed dissection and he also dipped his ink, his, uh, his uh, goose feather into his blood instead of ink, and he wrote down all the crimes that he committed. It was a kind of a anatomist macabre, I believe. We always hear that Tertius resigned in 1846, ending a 126 year old tradition. Well, by that time he was already 73 and his career spanned over 40 years. I believe he was an old man and he de deserved to retire. Just a, a little family fact, he married his cousin Maria Agnes Carmichael Smythe and had 12 children. So I will give you just two uh, items from this collection. One is outlines of the anatomy of the human body in its sound and disease state. So this is something that he wrote. It's quite interesting. I like this dedication where he says a gift to his son, son James in 1822. But what is also interesting is that uh, here it is dedicated to James Bruce um, Esquire, member of the Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh Surgeon to the Orphan Hospital and the one uh, and one of the surgeons to the institution for the gratuitous inoculations of cowpox. This item is a, in a very good condition. And this kind of cover and the binding uh, that marble that I was told was very popular in 1930s. And this is the last of the items that I would like to show you from the collection. This is actually the report from the Select Committee on Anatomy. It was ordered by the House of Commons to be printed in July 1828. So the, the problem of supplying bodies for dissection was present and it just got worse with the murders. So the committee was appointed to investigate the practice of anatomical schools in London. Actually, how did other medical schools uh, supply the bodies for dissection? And also the select committee appointed to inquire into the manner of obtaining subjects for dissection in the School of Anatomy and into the state of the law affecting the persons employed in, obtain, in, in obtaining or dissecting bodies have pursuant to the order of the house examined the matters of them referred and agreed to the following report. Now, here we've got a bill that was adopted, uh, that was passed in the parliament in 1832. And here we've got Tertius's written comments while they were still discussing. So here we saw that the committee was appointed in 1828 but the uh, anatomy act was passed in 1832 so it took about four years until they agreed so uh, the law uh, defines who can be dissected legally and so they included that the poor with no living relatives 
uh, the, uh, once they die, their body can be dissected. Uh, their body can be do donated to the um, anatomy for dissection, which completely outraged the poor because they thought not only that we are condemned to be poor, we do not have the right even for a decent burial. Rightly so. So David Monroe, Tosh's child. He is the one also, he was also practicing a physician in Scotland, but he was the one who immigrated in New Zealand in 1841. He only practiced very, very little uh, medicine in New Zealand. He was more into uh, farming, sheep farming and politics. And it seems like this is a trait in the family. They like to go into politics. And the moment they get into politics, they are good and they get knighted. Good on them. So in 1861, he was the speaker in the House of the Representatives, and in 1866, he was knighted. It was published in June in, um, 1866 in New Zealand Gazette, but in February 1866, it was published in London Gazette. Now, he married Dina Secker, had seven children, and five survived into adulthood. We've got only two items from his collection, uh, from um, David Monroe in the collection. Um, one that was written in 1837, which means while he was still in Scotland. And the other one, A33, is particularly dear to me. Here we can see that's the A32. We can see a beautiful drawing. And if you remember, his great-grandfather Primus was also an excellent artist. Here we've got a dry flower. And I find it, and I, I like to think that this is the flower that he brought from Scotland when he moved to New Zealand to remind him of his native land. Now, the archives of New Zealand have got a copy of Sir David's will, but this is now a New Zealand story, something that I would very happily tell you in some future lecture. Thank you very much. And now I would like to invite you to ask questions. Thank you. Yes, Jones. I've got one to uh, kick off with. Mariana, uh, right at the beginning, you um, showed us the uh, Galen yes. Opera Omnia. Yes. And you mentioned that there were annotations handwritten yes. in Latin on the sidebar yes. and in Greek. In the, the Greek on the on top, the, on the in the corner. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I found quite few of those scribbles on the side. Yes. So were the Latin and Greek annotations in other volumes? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Oh Several? yes. Yes. Whenever whenever they read something in its original language, uh, they would they would write, they would make comments in that particular language. Yes, they had a very good command in both Latin and, and Greek. Second question related to that. You, I got the impression that you said it was Secundus who made the annotations. Yes, yes. and do you know how I know? How do you know? Because, because I've, um, based on their manuscripts, I could recognize the handwriting. And I could, I could follow, uh, we've got some very early writings from Primus, we've got very early writing from Secundus when they were still trying to um, make their handwriting really nice and legible. So I can immediately, when I see I can always spot who wrote it. And there is one also interesting thing um, with Titius, for example, he always made comments in pencil. Mm. Oh, yes, I researched okay. that. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> really, really good observations there. Oh, and yes. There's a lot of oh, material yes. to follow up there. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, it's so remarkable. It's amazing. I just love, love looking at their manuscript. And, and whenever I'm in company of, uh, whenever I go to see any of the items, believe me, it's like meeting an old friend. Other questions? Yes. This is kind of curiosity. After, like, after you know, Charles II in that part of the century, was there an upsurge of interest in medicine as a prestigious career? Uh, yes, please. Um, so, uh, in Secundus in the 18th century, the 18th century, um, sorry, the 17th century. century. Charles II. Onwards, yes. was, there, was there interest 
in medicine as a prestigious profession, like as an alternative to law. You mentioned about law. Yeah, you know. Well, uh, I like to think, based on what I've read, that 18th century was, was the century of the Scottish Enlightenment. And with the establishment of the School of Medicine and Department of Anatomy in 1725, uh, the popularity of Primus as a lecture grew so much. And by the time Secundus took over, it was the place to study medicine and to go to Edinburgh. They had students from all over the world. It was really the most prestigious place to study medicine at that time. Now, the reason I asked was that Charles II had knighted a, a doctor, Thomas Brown, Brown spelled with an E, and he's regarded as the as the first physician, the first doctor to practice scientific medicine in the British um, in the, in the British version of the profession, Sir Thomas Brown. So I wondered if Thomas Brown had been knighted by Charles II, a lot of other people might have had an interest. Quite, quite possible. Unfortunately, I don't know much about that. 17th century. I don't know much. I uh, because we we don't have that many on the Monroes. Uh, most of my information comes from the biography by Inglis about the um, the Monroes of Ochenbawi, but I I assume it is quite possible that it was a very prestigious prestigious uh, profession. Thank you. Another question. Mm -hmm. Do a couple from the. Uh... From the chat here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for very interesting. It's actually a trailer because next month I'm going to be talking about the students in the 18th century Edinburgh. But uh, just an aside that this, the College of Surgeons in Edinburgh got a warrant from the Queen in 1508 to have one body of an executed criminal per year to do a public uh, dissection. To demonstrate things so this but this wasn't used very often but that they did have that right from the 16th century well yes i think what happened and what tarnished quite a lot tish's career were those anatomy murders um but what i'm really grateful for for him was that he had a vision even though he was not probably the best lecturer or he was not interested in teaching he was more into practice but what i'm immensely grateful for his vision is that he um he died in 1859 in 1841 his son david moved to uh to new zealand he resigned from the position of a professor in 1846 so I believe that even before he resigned, he must have spoken to David and tell him that the, the collection that he had would go to him. And I think it's really beautiful that his vision did not stop at Edinburgh, but he wanted to enable students and young generations of New Zealanders to learn from really uh, good sources. Other questions? Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. Where, where do I look? Zoomers, please, please. Uh, okay, it is not that the is it not because the medical students were required to have studied Latin and Greek to get into medical up to mid twentieth century, I believe. Well, I did a nursing training back home in Croatia, and one of the mandatory uh, papers that I did was Latin. So. We still, we still in Croatia, I mean, I can say in Croatia because I used to study medicine in Croatia, uh, we still communicate in Latin and everything, every single part of the body is in Latin. So when I did anatomy back home, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to translate in, into my language uh, part of the body, but I know perfectly well in Latin. So. I, I was a little bit um, surprised that here in New Zealand or the English speaking world, uh, people rely more on the Anglo version of the Latin terms, while we are still very, very strictly Latin speaking. 
Um, are there Monro descendants still in New Zealand? Yes, there are very many. And I'm happy to say that I've been in, com in contact with Dr. John Monroe from Palmerston North, who is direct great, 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 great grandson of that, of that Monroe, Monroe physicians of the Monroe um, professor generation. Can you explain? Yes, at least four on this call. Oh, yes. <laughs> Great to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So Davis was a sheep farmer, politician, and a botanist. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you, Helen. And there is, um, yes, David has three sons, all doctors, one surgeon to the king. Yes, that's true. Can you explain the long delay in the arrival of the collection in the needed? Well, um, the collection, when it left the shores of Scotland, so Tisha's, uh, Tisha's died in um, 1859, and immediately uh, the specimens that were in jars were donated to the uh, Anatomical Museum at Edinburgh. Now, in 1871, the books and manuscript left Edinburgh. So it does give us about 12 years. I don't know where the, the books or where the, that collection was for 12 years before they left for New Zealand. It took seven years for the collection to actually arrive in New Zealand. So my next goal is to explore the collection, um, the voyage of the collection. So I hope my next book will be on the collection itself and how it arrived all the way to Otago University. I also would like to mention that in uh, 19, sorry, 2029 is the centenary of the collection here at Otago uh, because uh, the collection arrived in uh, 1929. So I believe that there will be some sort of maybe exhibition or something, a series of public talks to, to mark it, because it's it's absolutely stunning collection. The perennial herb endemic. After Sir David, according to Wikipedia, maybe the flowers of that species. I don't know. Thank you very much, Hamish, for, for letting me know. But when I found it, it's not the only dry flower. I just presented one, one page, one sample. Um, there are there were, I think, two or three more. And I just thought, well, maybe he's really homesick after his Scotland. <laughs> oh, thank you very much for the comment. Well, Miriam, no, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for being such a wonderful audience. Any other questions or comments? No. Mariana, thank you so much for an absolutely wonderful thank presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to your um, next. next. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, Lots. Work in this project. Lots. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.